Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you a special segment in E4C's 2016 webinar series focusing on mobile data collection. My name is Jan Aranda, and I'm the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change. And I'll be today's moderator for the webinar. Now, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a bit about the Mobile Data Collection Series. The widespread availability of mobile communication offers international development researchers, practitioners, and students new tools and techniques for collecting field data and determining success of projects. So, we've partnered with the Development Impact Lab at UC Berkeley, or DIL for short, for a series of six webinars to introduce a sample of survey software tools and demonstrate how to implement each tool in practice. For a recorded introduction to the series, we invite you to visit the E4C homepage. Today's webinar is the second in the series featuring Kobo Toolbox, introduced by co-founder Hong Fang. Our next webinar will be with Survey CTO on March 10th at 12 p.m. EST, and we hope that you'll join us for that. If you would like to make a recommendation for a specific platform, future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the series team via the email addresses visible on the slide. Now, before we move to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge exchange platform and global community of nearly 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and so on. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources such as this webinar, and a growing database of hundreds of poverty alleviating products in our solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources that meet your needs and interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better around the world. Check out our website to learn more and sign up. We're excited to collaborate with DIL on this and future webinars. DIL is an international consortium of universities, research institutes, NGOs, and industry partners addressing global poverty through advances in science and engineering. Headquartered at the University of California in Berkeley, DIL was launched in 2012 with support from the U.S. Agency for International Development through the U.S. Global Development Lab. This leverages the innovative capacity of world-class universities to design development solutions which couple new technologies with novel economic and behavioral interventions. Dill calls this approach development engineering. Now, this webinar you are participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. The set webinar series is free and publicly available, showcasing the best practices and thinking of development practitioners. Information on upcoming installments in the series as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on our site, and you have the URL listed there, as well as on our YouTube channel. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. I'd like to see where folks are from today on the webinar. So this is a great opportunity for you to use the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen. Not to be confused with the question window, so I'll go ahead and get started today. I'm in lovely New Jersey. I see we have folks from Pennsylvania, but you have to put that into the chat window. Um, if the chat window is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the icon on the top right-hand corner of the WebEx window. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go into the chat window. And you can also feel free to send a private chat to the E4C admin. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks that you may have. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the icon on the top right-hand corner. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, 
try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. So I see we have folks from Germany and, and Calgary and definitely Berkeley. So welcome, everyone. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PH for this session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C professional uh, development page, and the URL is listed right there. Uh, and I see some other folks have entered um, their locations into the Q&A window. Just um, I, I see from Kinshasa and other parts of the world. We also see folks from Massachusetts and Indiana. Uh, please do use the chat window for any further comments, but keep your questions in the Q&A window. So thank you so much for uh, sitting through our preamble. With this, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Hong Pham, is an assistant professor um, at Harvard Medical School and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Director of Evaluation and Implementation Science at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. She has over 15 years of experience in designing and implementing epidemiologic and evaluation research, tech solutions, and educational programs in ongoing and post-conflict countries such as Northern Uganda, DRC, Rwanda, Central African Republic, and many others. Um, she co-founded peacebuildingdata.org and Kobo Toolbox, which she'll talk about today. Dr. Flam joined HHI after holding the position at UC Berkeley's Human Rights Center and Tulane University's Payson Center for International Development. We're very honored to have you here and look forward to learning more about Kobo Toolbox. Oh, you have to take off your mute. There we go. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Rihanna, for the introductions, and um, thank you, um, Engineering for Change and Development Impact Lab, for organizing um, today's webinar and, and inviting us to participate. Um, um, as um, Inanna mentioned, I, uh, I I used to work at UC Berkeley, so I'm quite familiar with um, the group there, and I'm, I'm glad to to be back and participate in in one of the events. Um, we uh, started. Kobo Toolbox um, uh, back in 2005. Um, really, I, I'm an epidemiologist by training, so I do a lot of research, especially in post-conflict situations. So originally, Kobo Toolbox was developed for our team to meet some of our needs that were not um, met with some of the commercials and some of the free software that were available. I think since then, um, the chain... Um, the scene has changed a lot, and there are much more uh, software and tools available, uh, much more than back then. I think back then when we started it, um, we didn't even have a smartphone, so that's how you know archaic that was back then. Um, we had to use these Palm Pilot uh, uh, handheld organizer and attach GPS devices to it um, to be able to do some of the capability that we are doing now. So the, the sea has changed a lot. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit um, about, just in general, about digital data collections, and then I'll jump in and introduce you to the tool, uh, COBOL toolbox. Um, you know, before um, I wanted to uh, start, I think I used to, when we start, first started out this field, we had to try to convince people that collecting data digitally was, um, was superior to paper-based, but I think now it's transparent that it, it does provide much more efficiency um, and it does, uh, in the long run, better quality data. Um, and I think this slide is just to say, how can I trust your information when you're using such outdated technology? I think doing paper-based, there's, there's still time and places for it, but I, I think um, uh, the, 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 in terms of research, um, I think more and more people are using um, digital platforms to collect their data and manage their data. Um, so why collect data digitally? Um, it's, um, it both opportunity to improve process and output of primary data collections. I think, um, you know, designing and preparing questionnaires and recruiting and all that, it may take longer using a digital platform. And I'm, I'm, I'm not in terms of only just in terms of time, it takes more advanced planning. Um, but um, uh, a lot of these can, can be done in advance, and I think over time, as, as we found out in our research, we've been um, conducting research 
in over 15 countries over the last uh, 12 or 13 years um, uh, that over time actually uh, going digital save us um, a lot of time because um, all of our uh, instruments are digitized and so uh, the process becomes um, much more efficient um, as uh, you move forward. Uh, uh, this is not needed to say, but um, uh, to get from you know data collections to data presentations takes a long time before it needs to take me about three to um, four weeks just to enter data and to verify the data. And now we can look at data on a daily basis and a nightly basis. Um, it also improves the quality, great, greater accuracy, easier analysis, increased comparability, and improves sharing. So these are some of the benefits of collecting data digitally. Um, some of the key features. Um, I think this has changed a lot. When I first started out um, to create a form, you needed some programming languages. And I think over time, uh, this has improved uh, and became more user-friendly. So um, one of the challenges that I, I gave my programmers when we first started out Cobalt Toolbox was that I wanted them to create a tool that allowed me to use it in the field without their support. That means I can create the forms, I can look at the data that I've collected, and I can visualize it without their support. And at the beginning, the first few years, we still needed their support, but um, over time, as they advanced in their development, the tool got much easier to use. Um, the, the second criteria that we had because um, of the type of research that we did, I was based at the Human Rights Center, was the data had to be uh, secured and encrypted. And so that was another um, key feature requirements for um, developing the tool. Um, the third one is um, uh, we work in a lot of post-conflicts and in humanitarian crisis situations, so often um, there's no internet connection, so um, we need a lot of offline capability. Um, and the other thing is to have support um, in remote um, deployment and, and that the technology really need uh, or permit low-tech implementations, meaning that you know we can work on devices that doesn't require a lot of batteries or that we have some sort of backup systems in case. Um, I think one of the place, first places that we pilot our technology was um, in the Central um, Republican, um, uh, Central African Republic, and outside of the capital, there was no electricity, so we needed uh, devices that could, you know, um, allow us to function outside of the capital. Um, a recent requirement we had was we realized that over time, as we uh, did our research, a lot of the, if you're, you're involved with research, um, three-fourths of your time that you spend in research is at the be beginning, trying to develop the questionnaires, the, the design. And a lot of times you have to do a lot of background research. And then, uh, so let's say, for example, you want to do assessments on mental health. You would re try to reach out to other researcher and try to find out questions that they have posed to assess um, mental health. And so they exist in Excel, PDF form and all different formats. And so it takes a long time to get all of those. And so one of the recent requirements we wanted to do was to create a, a library function that allows you to archive research questions and then share them with others and then also be able to index it in a way that is easy to search and um, for you to organize those questions. So that's one of the new features that we have. Um, and I think over time, I think as that feature get expanded and more people contribute to the library, I think we're going to see a lot of improvement and standardizations of, of research over time. And also, you will see the research cycles much more efficient for the next researcher. Um, the other features that is, is uh, in key is the data cleaning and data visualization. And then uh, the last one is the ability to import and export the, the data in different, um, to different tools and have different APIs. So those are some of the key features um, that I'm going to go over that our tool has. Um, so before I introduce you to Kobo, this is a, a typical workflow if you are the administrator. An administrator is a person who actually manages the um, data collections um, process. 
So, you know, first always is selecting the right devices, um, uh, then designing, creating the questionnaire online, then create a place to store it, you manage the data, and then you create the visualization analysis. Um, um, typical uh, workflow for a data collector is um, with COBOL Toolbox, you can um, uh, collect data via two ways. One, if you use an Android device, you can download the app or if you use other devices such as iPhone or the window-based one, um, you can use it through a browser. So you can install the app through um, the uh, Google um, Market and then, uh, or you just open a browser um, to that URL that you're provided. And then you download the data forms and then you collect the data and then you submit the data. And the data can be submitted um, uh, when you have uh, the internet connections or you can transfer it uh, in the old way, just connecting it to a USB cord and putting in a computer and then uh, upload the forms when you're ready uh, and you have the internet connection. So um, COBOL to Work is developed by the Harvard Humanitarian um, Resources. It's an open source tool for data collection. And some of the more recent changes that we've made was actually catered toward um, humanitarian worker working in emergency situations. So um, with that, I'm going to switch screen. I'm going to start sharing my desktop and go into the tool. Um, can you see my screen? Great. So what, when you get there, uh, our, our website is um, cobotoolbox.org. And to get started, you just click on getting, Get Started. And you can create um, an account in two ways. If you are an humanitarian uh, working for a humanitarian organization, so you can sign up here. And the benefits of it is that you get um, much more um, support, and also you have unlimited uh, ability um, to upload as many forms as you like or as many data points um, as you like. Um, COBOL Toolbox, we have some limitations of how much forms and how much data, though um, no one has reached those limits yet. Uh, and so you can sign up um, on either side. So if, um, I recommend if you're not a humanitarian, working for a humanitarian organization, you do the, the researchers um, and workers. Um, I think as of today, we have equal number of people using both sites. Um, and so you just click on sign up or log in. And you shouldn't get this case. I'm already logged in, so uh, I, it's taking me to a form. But for the first time, you should see a login screen. Um, and uh, you sign up for the account. And then you would go to your email um, and click on, uh, to verify that account. And then uh, it will allow you to open. But once you open the form, uh, the, the, uh, the site and you log in, you should see the screen. If this is the first time that you created the account, you would not see any form, but the first place it will take you is the form. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that um, we are now in um, uh, in the we're releasing a beta version, and we're in the process of um, of making that a full up. Right now, you have the options to opt in, but I think in a couple of weeks we're going to force everyone into this new version. Um, so when you log in for the first time, this is the old version, how it looks like. But um, you will also get this kind of um, orange flag in the bottom that allows you to take you to the new version. I recommend you using um, the, uh, the new versions if this is your first time using COBOL Toolbox. Um, we left the old versions available for those who are familiar and want to kind of ease in. Even if you opt in, you have the ability to, to opt out afterwards. So uh, you can click here. And it gives you uh, kind of an overview of some of the new feature. Um, and I think some of the new features are um, some of the question library uh, that we have developed. Some of the feature there has been updated. But I'm going to quickly go into the new tool and just kind of give you an over sense. So COBOL uh, Toolbox has three workspaces. Um, one is the form that allows you to create the form. Um, the other one is the library that allows you to index your library questions that you've archived. And the last one is the project. This is once you 
start data collection, um, this is where you manage the data. So those are your three workspaces, and you can see here that there's other settings like leave beta. As I mentioned, you can leave the beta version anytime at this moment, but once we force everyone in, you, you can't do that. Um, so let me go back to the form. So what I'm going to do for the, the purpose of this demo is I'm going to create a new form. You can also uh, upload a form that someone share with you as well. So I'm going to create a new form. And um, here on this kind of icon setting, you can set up these meta metadata. And these are the data that are collected um, in the background, and your um, data collector will not see this. I always have the start time and end time because I want to know how long it takes them. Um, I, I like to also have the dates as well. So you can choose other metadata that you collect, but those are the three that I normally click. But by default, it will already collect the start time and end time. You can uncheck that if you like. Um, you so if you want to add questions, you click on here. And let's just say, um, let's do a question about um, uh, data collection tool. So uh, first, I want to know your name. And so you add the question. And here, a box, uh, an option box, um, sorry, name, uh, an option box up here. And here are all the different types of questions, um, options that you have. A select one is like, for example, gender. Um, you have one for male, two for female. Select many if you have a question like, how do you feel today? And you allow people to select um, a couple options. Text. This is, um, since this is name, this is um, a text field um, for this one. A numeric, let's say if you ask how old are you, decimal, let's say uh, give me your weight with decimal points. Uh, what is your birth date for the next field, which is the date. Time functions, um, what time do you no normally eat breakfast in the morning, and a time and a date field that allows you to collect both the time and the date. Um, GPS. In all my questions, um, questionnaire, I always include a GPS as the first questions. Actually, I'm going to change this to GPS because I always do that. And the reason why is that I like for all of my data collectors to record the GPS points so that I can monitor um, uh, them in the field and allow see where they're collecting data and whether they're following the right sampling strategy. Another one is photo. Um, you can take photos. Um, let's say you're doing an assessment on injuries and you want to take a picture of that injury so you can have a field um, of questions on just to uh, allow people to capture the photo. Uh, an audio, um, this is great if you're actually using this function, this form to do a mixed method or to do a qualitative assessment. Let's say you're doing focus group and you are doing you know, 10 different focus groups. And so you can organize the focus group audio using this form by saying, you know, this is focus group number one, uh, how many people participated in it, and then you can have the audio function that allows you to record the entire focus group. Uh, video, the same way, instead of audio, you have video. Notes, these are questions that allows you to have a placeholder. What happens is um, on the applets, by default, it shows you one question at a time. So if you have sections, this allows you to kind of say, this is your starting section two, or if you want a field that allows you to um, provide a note to your interviewer to read to the participant, or a note to your uh, interviewer. So let's say, um, uh, you know, uh, please read this to the participant. You know, um, this question is, a five-point questions or something like that. Um, it's not necessary a field that for them to complete, but it's just a note for the um, interviewer. Barcode is great. This is um, allows you to scan barcode, and we use this function a lot when we do longitudinal study or um, we do a, a panel study where um, we, for example, um, did a study where we interviewed the. Uh, a child and the caregiver, and so we would have the same barcode created for the child and, and caregiver, and we would have two forms, and the barcode would allow us to know uh, um, which child belongs to which parent, um, and so it allows us to merge the data later on. 
the knowledge is great. It's, let's say, for example, you have to read an informed consent and you want your interviewer to acknowledge that they've read the um, informed consent form. You have that. Calculate is wonderful for those who are trying to um, come up with some sort of calculation space on two or three questions. For example, let's say um, you're doing nutrition assessments and you want to measure the, the upper arm circumference and try to determine and the weight um, to determine whether a child is malnourished. So you can, based on a couple of fields, you can say, oh, this child is malnourished or not um, and have that uh, calculation done. And a lot of people find that useful because then you can have it right there rather than waiting until after the data collection is completed to determine that child needs referral to um, a health provider or not. Um, matrix and rating are great. This is a complex form. It's actually collecting a couple of uh, collections at the same time, but basically it's, let's say, um, uh, uh, you can just say, you know, uh, uh, what is your priorities and, uh, and rate them, and so it allows you to, to do that. Or let's say um, you have a uh, PTDSD scale, um, and it's 17 questions using five Likert score. And so rather than repeating those options over and over, you can build a, a matrix that has, you know, all the questions in one, um, in one row, in one column, and then the, option, the five option choice on the next um, five uh, column. And ranking the same thing, like um, what is your priorities, and it allows you to list all the priorities and then allow the user to rank them in the order of importance. So those are really a nice uh, feature that we use quite often. So let me just select GPS for this quick question. And then I'm going to create another one. And let's do age. And that's going to be a number. I'm going to add another one called gender. Um, and that's a single select. Hold on. Let me move up the screen. Um, Gender, add a question, select, and I'm going to do uh, male and then female. Uh, and then automatically it numbers everything in um, one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to create male as zero. I, I like creating zero space and one so that when you do logistic regressions or something like that, it's already coded in um, um, binary numbers. Um, and then uh, the next question, let's do, um, let's go, uh, let's do a question about, uh, uh, let's ask all the female um, uh, questions. Let's say we want to ask this, uh, maybe I shouldn't have made this, but maybe we make this about the Zika. Are you pregnant? Um, and sorry, I'm going to move the screen up here. Add questions, and I'm trying to get the screen below um, to do that. Are you, are you pregnant? Um, and the next question, the reason why I want to insist on doing this is that I want to show you the, the skip logic. Um, and I, uh, this will be uh, select one, uh, no, um, yes. Uh, 
set this as zero and setting this as one. And then I want to go into this setting and I want to ask this question to only to female. So I go into the skip logic and I add a condition, set this question, um, then, and this is to be female. I can also add a gender and say um, another condition would be uh, age, and only if this person is, like I would say, of reproductive age, so let's say 15 years old and older. So um, those are the two conditions. And then um, you can exit out of that. So that's how you would do that. Uh, uh, conditions. Um, the other thing you can do on the age, and let's say if you interview people, and I go here, validation rule, is I want to add a condition that, let's say, this question has to be greater than somebody who is 10 years old. That means uh, if they interview anyone um, younger than 10 years old, there will be an error message. Say um, you interview, um, please select, please um, make sure make sure you have the, the correct age or um, or select an eligible um, respondent. So these are the, the error message that would come up. And so I, I'm going to save this, but a good feature of this is look in the preview. If once I do some of these conditions, I just want to test it. So I, I'm going to try to enter somebody nine, and then um, the, the GPS, because this is a, a web form, you would have to choose the location. So you would see that an error message arrive here, that um, nine, you, you have not correct some, somebody, so I would have to enter something that is above 10. If I do 10, hopefully that's the error message will, will, will go away. Um, so I'm going to do 10, um, and then, um, let's do uh, female. Let's do a C. Uh, if so, let me see. There. So now it's the right condition. I do female, um, and it's required. And there is um, there should be a uh, another question that showed up and it didn't show up. So I need to get out here and I can go back to my setting again. And I need to go to the setting and see if I selected the right condition. Are you pregnant? And skip logic. Oh, this person has to be over 15, so that's why. Okay, so I do preview, and let's just I enter somebody who's 16 years old and female, and then you see that option. So you see that that skip logic and that um, validation rule uh, works. And so this is how you test your form. Um, and just for the fun of it, I'm just going to do one question that is a photo. So let's say photo of somebody. Um, uh, do photo and add a question. And this is going to be a, um, a photo question. So I'm, I'm going to save it. and. Uh, I've already tested out all of the um, preview functions. And so now you, uh, you save it. And when you're ready to deploy it, um, you can just uh, hit deploy. The other function I didn't show you is on here. Um, let me see if I can do zoom in a little bit more. You see here it said add to the library. Let's just say I always have library, a GPS, and I don't want to program it again. I can just add this to my, my question library. So I can just click on here and just click on Add Library, and it will add to the library. Um, add If you want to add any questions, then you just click on it, and it just adds to the library. Um, so now I'm, I'm done. I'll save, and then I close it. Um, and then um, I have a couple options. Uh, I can share this. If I want to um, share this, this is one of the new features of the new COBOL. You won't see this, all of these options in the old version. This is um, only now in the, the new version, the beta version. You can share this with another person and give them different privileges um, and just say uh, you have to have their names or you can share the link. Um, so uh, 
uh, and they have they can edit it or view it only. So you can give them a kind of working like Google Doc allows you different privileges. You can download this uh, forms into an XLS forms. You can clone it. Let's say if you want to revise this form, but you want to keep a, an old version of it, you can clone it and then revise a version of it. Deploy it when you're ready to uh, to collect data. So you just hit deploy. And once you hit deploy, you're just going to create an ID. I'm going to call this Zika, uh, Zika2. Um, uh, and I click OK. So the form has been deployed. That means now you can see in this project view. So if you want, want to be able to collect the data, click on um, how to collect data on mobile devices. And here you will see there's instruction. Um, uh, here, um, if you collect it on, uh, a, using an Android device, you download the applet, and under the general setting, you will enter a URL. And here, it will give you the specific URL to the specific uh, site. And once you have this URL, um, there's an a, a icon to say um, download form, and you click on download forms, and it should have you have a list of all the forms that is available for you to download. And then that's how you have the form. Um, the other way is to give people this website. Um, if you're online, I'm going to copy this um, over, and I'll put this link to the chat room. And if you can, um, go to that form, and if you can start filling it out, or if you have an Android uh, phone or a tablet, I, I welcome you to download the applets and, and do this. But if one or two of you can start filling out the form, that would be great. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Um, and uh, that way I can show you some of the, the next few uh, functions within the project uh, setting. Um, if you see here this the submission form, I see right now that no one has submitted any form, so if a few of you can do that, that would be great. And then I will be able to see, um, let me see, I'm sorry. Actually, I send it to all uh, the sites. So. Okay, I see one submission so far. That's great. Would you be able to open the link yourself as well, just so people can see how it looks? Yes, um, sure. So um, I will do that right now. It should look something like this. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using the web for the locations, you will have to zoom into your locations or type in uh, the address. Um, and then I do invite you to take a photo of yourself if you can. <laughs> Selfie time. Yeah. Here. So let's see that one. Okay, great. So I see six. So um, one thing I could do immediately is look on view map. I always like to view map because then it's, that's why I like the GPS, because then I can zoom in to see where all of the GPS locations are. Um, I, for, for me, this is great, because um, I, we do a lot of um, survey sampling, so I like to see if they follow the right sampling strategies, if they're clustering. The other thing is to see if people make faking data. Um, if you see one person standing at the same location all the time, uh, then, um, then uh, you notice, know, and they're you know taking ten minutes to complete the form. You know something went wrong. 
Um, let, us, let me move out of here because I only see one GPS location, or did, is there more? Oh, yes, there's a few more. So, so here, view by. The other thing you can view by the different categories that you collected by gender. So here I can see that there's two, three uh, male collected the data and uh, four female. Uh, you can do view by pregnancy to see where the pregnancy cases are. Uh, no, or view by uh, any other categories that you have your data on. So that's that's a nice function to look at. So you can see different type of clustering already with the map. So that's one great place to look at. Um, so let's go back. Uh, uh, Zika two. Um, the other one you can do view gallery. So here is if you had photos, you can view all the photos um, that's collected. It takes a few seconds. You can, see, you can see some photos of the participants. Oh, okay. Um, that's the first one. Somebody can laptop. Somebody slide. Great. So great sense of humor. <laughs> I see a lot of great photos there. Okay, great. Um, the other thing that you could do is view data in table form. Uh, and so to here you can browse your data just as if like it's in Excel. The other thing is you can show the value in XML or you can show the label that you provided. So then you can actually see the, the label of it. Uh, this, I'm going to go back. Um, the other thing you can do is analyze, some, do some basic frequency. Uh, let's do gender is easy. Um, you can do frequency or percentage. Um, and then you can see the response there. Uh, the other thing you can do is analyze the data, uh, download the data. Um, you can do XLS. I always do a, C a CSV. Those are easy. The other one that we've also allowed is this Excel analyzer. And this is an Excel spreadsheet that allows you to download. Mm -hmm. I see a little uh, error message. Something's wrong with it. I'll, I'll ask the programmer to look at it. Um, but you can da download the Excel analyzer and Basically, uh, this Excel analyzer has some um, pre-coded uh, tabs that allows you to do basic analysis and graphing that has already been programmed for you based on the data structures that we have here. So this is a really neat function. We were using this to train people at, in UNICEF um, on how to analyze some of the data, and so it's, it's really a, a nice feature. Um, so that's really basically it really here in the project management. Um, when I, I'm going to take you back to the form, and one of the things I want to show you, which I, I didn't go through, um, is uh, let's do the, the Zika survey. Uh, I'm going to edit it. Um, one of the things I didn't show you is the, the library function. So if you have a library here, um, you can search for it. Let me see if I, I thought I have a library here. I do. Okay. So let's go back to here. And let's do the CAP survey here, um, edit. And so let's say I want to search my library and I want to do something on um, gender base. Uh, or let's do, how about, um, I see, uh, education. Uh, and let's see. Okay, so you see a lot of things here. Let's say number of children pre and post crisis, labor, home, school information regarding safety in school. Let's look at that or vocational training. Um, I can expand the details. Um, some of these questions are exist in blocks. That means, for example, um, if you want to do vocational trainings, you can have a set of five questions. So once you expand, you can see the questions. And let's say I want to use this question. I decided this is, do you have... Do people have jobs, require education? Let's just say I really like these questions. I can drag these questions over to my questions, and that's that's how you would use the library. Um, so once you archive it, you can pull any questions that you search, and you, and you saw that at the beginning for the form, I had to add and program each question. It takes a lot of time, but once you have this library, you can start pulling out. Let's say this one, I just pulled this. And I can just build my form just based on pulling um, existing questions that I've already built. Um, so that's just the library functions. Um, just wanted to go back on that. But um, 
I, I'm, I'm done right now with the demo in terms of our basic functions, but I want to open it up to some Q&A for any you know, questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Fong. Um, so very quickly, while you're on the library, so just to confirm, the library is comprised of questions that the individual builds, or it's actually pulling questions from other organizations that have already uh, built surveys via Kobo Toolbox? Um, both. Um, it, it's um, the library questions right now. We're we're going to create a, a library. I mean, um, a website that allows you to pull uh, libraries that other people have created. But right now, the way the library function work is that it's your individual library, and then you share those library with others once you 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 created a library. So let's say I'm in the library function, and um, I created this is the IRC, and I want to share it. So I just click mm -hmm. share, and and you can share this with whoever um, you want, uh, or you can share the link publicly. And this is where I said that we're going to create once we release this beta version, we're going to create a a page where people can start sharing those library links um, and download the library function. So this is why I said this is um, this is my next push is trying to get people to start um, kind of like the Wikipedia <laughs> creating yeah. a, a survey, you know, uh, 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 library bank. Well, we're, we're big fans of libraries here at Engineering for Change, so we certainly support that effort. So a uh, few questions have come in, and I want to make sure to address them uh, even though we, we're a little short on time. The first question is regarding your definition of humanitarian organization. Can you please provide a, a little clarification of how uh, you qualify those organizations? Uh, wow. Um, I think it's any organizations that is now working on one of the L3 crisis. Um, that's the way I think uh, OCHA is defining it, I, I believe. And I, I, I welcome others who, you know, I, I think uh, Patrick is online if he wants to put use the chat function to answer that. But I believe right now it's any organizations that is working on uh, one of the L3 crises. Um, okay. Cool, thank you. And Patrick, we we'll certainly please uh, share your insight. Another question of a practical nature is: Is there any cost associated with using Cobalt Toolbox? No, it's it's free. Um, uh, so it's open to to anyone, um, and so there's no cost associated with it. Fantastic. So um, those are those are really good insights for the users. I think we're gonna have to. Uh, pause here and we, we'd like to definitely thank uh, you for sharing uh, this fantastic overview with us. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, open up the slide here and thank all of our participants today. So uh, for those of you whose questions weren't addressed, we do apologize. Please feel free to email us with your questions and we'll be happy to pass them on for um, feedback. Uh, for those of you who are looking to receive your professional development hours, the code is listed on the slide. And and uh, we'd like to invite you all to join us as the first team members to receive invitations to upcoming webinars and also to keep tabs on uh, issues of importance for development engineering. With that, I'd like to thank our speaker. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us from around the world and wish you all a fantastic afternoon, evening, or morning, depending where you are. Talk to you all soon. Take care.